Today, we're joined by two very enterprising ladies. And you see, I like to, I like that because we come from a culture where a man's world all this time. So when you come across two ladies that are trying to change the world, you have to be happy and welcome them to Diaspora Weekly. Ladies, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Good to be here. I have, I have to my right here, I don't know, based on how you're looking, the one sporting the Ukrainian colors, Amma Jampo. Amma, welcome. Thank you. And then, <laughs> and then I have Olivia in tow. Both of these ladies are from UK. Olivia, welcome. Thank you, guys. Lovely to be here. All right. Now, what we do here at Diaspora Weekly is very, I know most interviews, they get right to the point, but for us, we have to know you. I find that in business, when people want to do business with you, they have to know you. Tell us about yourself. Let's start with you, Olivia. Who is Olivia? Who am I? Um, well, full name is Olivia Sierunto. I am half a Kriapim and half a Da, so it's a bit of an interesting mix. Um, grew up mm -hmm. a bit in Ghana before I moved, um, kind of moved around a bit and then ended up in the UK. Um, background has kind of been in, in marketing, communications, um, kind of, kind of fell into that mainly because my dad used to be the, um, the ambassador here in, in Ghana, the, um, Ghana High Commission. And so his role within sort of communications and within information really kind of, um, I guess kind of led me to be in that particular role in terms of how he communicated about Ghana every time we went on different parts of the world or across on, on tour, talking so passionately about, about Ghana and about Africa and how he kind of used his effervescence in terms of trying to get people to understand the true richness of, of Africa by using communications and using information. So for me, that was very interesting. And then I sort of fell into that, into that space. Um, I was out in the UK for a good 30 odd years. Um, before moving back, uh, moving back to okay. Ghana nine years ago, I'm kind of telling my age now. But, but, you did, um, but nine years ago, <laughs> sorry. You did say your father was the ambassador here, meaning Accra, because yes. you're in Accra. Many, many yes, sorry, in ambassador Accra. for yes, Ghana but, ambassador, but ambassador the, uh, in Accra. Yes, in Accra. Yes, for Ghana ambassador Commission. in Accra. Yes. You, you're talking about a Ghana High Commission in the UK, right? Mm, no. The Ghana High Commission here. In Accra. How do you have Ghana Com yeah. High Commission it's in like, Accra? It's like the information services, whatever it's called here. I don't know what they call it here. But it's either the information services or oh, the okay. diplomatic service, whatever it is okay. in Ghana. Yeah. And then when you move to okay. different countries, okay. it's called the Ghana High Commission in that particular country. Um, so, kind okay. of, did, you know, we travel around quite a bit. Background was in marketing and communication, so worked with some really big um, communication agencies, advertising agencies in the UK, and their kind of skills in terms of marketing, but also sort of working with organisations in helping them find their purpose by figuring out what their business was stood for, how we're able to communicate that, but also understanding some of the quality assurance issues that we're facing, because in essence, you don't want you don't necessarily want to start communicating for a company or a business um, that really didn't have true understanding of what their business was about it's almost like putting putting lipstick on a, on a monkey so she's trying to figure out in term in essence right. what they're they stood for and then communicating that so did that for the longest time came back to ghana um worked for sort of um scanner and publicists um, and a number of kind of agencies here um and i guess from there i just thought actually i really want to start working with smes and want to start working with um looking at how we can solve certain issues in africa so i set up a, um, a management consultancy called the connection I uh, did that for about two years within that time, trying to figure out how to be able to look at the different sectors and segments within Ghana and how we're able to fix it, where are the innovations. And doing that by myself, that was, it was a bit of a struggle because not really understanding our system. Um, and that's kind of through through doing that, I met Emma and as you see, the rest is history. <laughs> good, very good. So Emma, who is Emma Jampo? Thanks, Jermaine. So I moved to Ghana eight years ago, and prior to that, you know, grew up in, in, in West London, um, you know, used to come to Ghana quite a bit, you know, my parents on holiday. And then, you know, fast forward several years, you know, I, I, I worked 
as a program manager for corporations like BlackBerry, Vodafone as a consultant. And then, you know, I, I always had a passion for entrepreneurship in terms of just, you know, people's startup stories and how they made it. And, you know, I, was always, I would always, you know, read people's stories and follow that very closely growing up, um, especially in my, you know, early adult life. And so, you know, having worked, um, you know, for several years in the UK, over 15 years, I decided to move back to Ghana with my family. Uh, my, my kids were quite young at the time, but now they're, they're both taller than me, which is, I don't know how that's happened. But we moved back in 2012. Um, and I've always been very much, um, you know, in the entrepreneurship ecosystem, you know, working with SMEs in technology, um, in agribusiness, uh, export businesses, very much, you know, as a, a mentor, a coach and, you know, providing training and support services to these companies um, and entrepreneurs, you know, very passionate about the, the potential of women in particular and youth uh, to solve our, our, you know, our crisis in uh, employment and, you know, and our human capital as well, as well as our market access. Um, potential. So I've always been, you know, very close, um, closely working with a lot of SMEs directly. And as Olivia just said, you know, we met, we were introduced to a friend, a mutual friend, another diaspora from the UK, but she she was in Ghana and, um, you know, we connected and we just, you know, had so much in common in terms of what we want to do to really make a mark um, as returnees. Um, you know, we're very privileged to have a lot, you know, in terms of our education, our background, having you know the exposure that many people don't have and so we we both have that ethos and you know um culture of giving back very much so and so scale up africa is very much about addressing um some of the challenges in particular you know our, our poor productivity and um growth prospects of our smes um in africa across the continent and in the diaspora as well so hence why um you know, we, we came up with this idea of uh, the Ignite our, our Business Growth Festival, which is coming up on the 6th of August. Yeah. Okay, very good. Both of you, I get the impression that neither of you is keen when it comes to somebody else. You guys are very entrepreneurial. Is that what's driving this agenda? Uh, we are at heart. And I really Olivia? We, we, we <laughs> I think there's a there's a mix of you know we've had our training in terms of seeing how other people have done it, and then you have your own ideas as to how you want to do it. I mean, I'll raise my hand and say I've been fired quite a number of times okay. because it's hard to manage somebody that always has their own approach to things. And so maybe it's a case of maybe working for other people is not your bag. It's fine. <laughs> maybe it's not your bag, but I still think yeah. you need that sort of thing. You need to be able to be in a situation where you're learning from somebody that knows what they're doing in an organization and then be entrepreneur i think right now you you probably start to see a number of um young people just like you know i run my own business and it never works for anybody in their lives i'm like well you need to learn from somebody before you end up being a leader like you need to be a follower before you become a leader so you understand how to run a business so that's that's kind of how i see it and i think um Emma can probably attest to a, a similar a similar um thing as well yeah i mean we, we both had our experiences you know in life um you know, after uni, you know, you work, you, you get, you, you have several jobs at some point in your life, you know, when you're in the diaspora, it's very normal to have a job and taking you through university or college. That's, that's normal. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a luxury in terms of, you know, having the opportunity to work and learn skills and learn from other people who are much more senior than you. Um, but unfortunately, you know, where we are here in Accra, in Africa, generally, there aren't that many opportunities. So we, we find that a lot of people are, are lacking the, the fundamentals that it takes to, to, to establish and grow their businesses. So that's a gap that we are here to. But you guys, uh, you are booking the trend. You left, but you've willingly come back and want to make a difference. Why is that? What drove you to come back? <laughs> um, I mean, for me, um, I, I, at the stage that we came back, I had young children. I was the consultant mm -hmm. traveling a whole lot you know, working in the telecoms industry, uh, working, you know, Canada one end of the day, Australia the other end of the day, um, seeing my kids very little, uh, very stressed out, basically, I, you know, very, a lot of pressure and on timelines and, you know, lifestyle and all that kind of stuff wasn't really um, a, a part of the equation. So for us, I mean, you know, my, my husband had always wanted to come back. You know, I was that, you know, uh, part of your, in terms of the service, you just excited. I was one of the, the women that were like, oh, you know, Ghana, it's too, you know, it's, it's too hot, you know, mosquitoes. That was me, you know. Um, but I think at a certain point in time, uh, assessing, you know, 
you know, being a certain age, you know, with young children and, you know, hearing, reading the news about, you know, knife crime and all those kinds of statistics. And, you know, even now is even more relevant, just all the all the prospects for young uh, black children um, or youth in, in, you know, abroad. Um, you know, all these things kind of swung it for me in terms of really making a bold change and and getting a bit more out of life, you know, just in terms of being able to do maybe go down the road, less travel, but, you know, less security, a lot more risky, a lot more, um, you know, um, uncertain for sure. But, but, but definitely, you know, having a bigger payoff in the long run. So, you know, it was really a... Okay, so has it been worth it? Has the return been worth it? Yeah, I mean, short answer, absolutely. I mean, just the quality of conversations, the quality of people you meet. <laughs> Very, um, you know, it's, it's almost like, I yeah. call it psychological well, warfare. You need to be tuned in for for, for the uncertainty yeah. and the chaos, you know? But I, I think, you know, we are a generation where we haven't got any wars to contend with. You know, we're we're in a pretty stable environment. You know, we're very very privileged in in the way that we've been brought up by our parents uh, and their opportunities. You know, you know, in, in my father's generation, you know, some of them went to school and walked for miles without shoes. You know, you hear these stories. You know, people who had to walk miles. You know, from Kenya, from Ghana, from Nigeria. You know, a lot of Africans in in, in the generation before us had to go through a lot. You know, it was only because they were smart or had you know opportunities to grow. You know go to school or, you know, get scholarships that they were able to break up out of their situation. Absolutely. And so I, I definitely feel that sense of responsibility. You know, we, we are privileged. Okay. And, you know, this this for us okay. is our is our opportunity to make a difference, you know, to the yeah. continent. What about you, Olivia? Why did you come back? I think it's, it's kind of similar to Emma's situation. With mine, I think I probably got to a stage where I peaked too soon. Um, because when you're, I guess, when, when I left... When we left Ghana, we moved to the UK and we traveled quite a bit. And yes, absolutely, well, that's exactly spot on in terms of what Anna is saying with kind of having the privilege to be able to see how others work or do things in different parts of the world and kind of giving you that that sort of motivation to always do better and do more. So I think I just got to a stage in my life where I kind of peaked a bit too, too quickly where I started to feel that there must be more because the UK started to feel quite easy at one point in terms of either in my career or in my personal life or, you know, things such as that I wanted more. And I've never been back to Ghana for the longest time when, I, when we moved. So when I initially came back for a few months to see how it was, I thought, I love this. I mean, I wasn't working here when I, when I came for the first few months. I lived with my brother and it was great to just kind of just see how Ghana truly was after so many years of being away. And even back then I could see that there were opportunities, but I couldn't quite pinpoint or have the network to be able to start to build it. So I thought, actually, you know what? When I get back to the UK, I literally spent a month, packed up my bags and said to my parents, right, I'm, I'm going. And I left, I literally left and I came. And it's been a marathon. In my mind, I thought it would be a sprint. But as Emma was saying, it's, okay. it's completely different terrain. It's, it's, it's so tiring. It of course, of course. Okay. I mean, exactly what okay. in terms of the connections that you make, the conversations that you have. It's a completely different terrain. Things are still slightly kind of like there are opportunities that people can't see that you can bring to the table. And we've been lucky enough to see all these things happen in, in Europe or in the US where you're thinking it's not here yet. So there's still it's still green and there's so many more and so yeah. much more that can be done. So it's definitely been worth okay. it, but it's been a marathon. It's definitely been a marathon. So there are two schools of thought. School number one says be certain on what you want to do before you set out to come. And then school number two says, no, 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 no. Whatever you come with, chances are it's going to change. So you need to come with an open mind. Look at what's needed before you decide on what to do. Which side are you on on those arguments? I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm on the fence, unfortunately. I mean, definitely, we, we came with quite a bit of heart. <laughs> we we, we oh, yeah. came with quite a bit of heart. Okay, a bit of heart and, and not so much planning. But look, in hindsight, hindsight is a beautiful thing. Uh, in hindsight, you know, uh -huh. there, there were deal opportunities that I remember years ago, people were like, oh, you know, you should buy in this estate in Ghana. I'm like, ah, I'm paying my mortgage in London. Why would I, you know, look at investing in Ghana? Back like yeah. 4 to 15 <laughs> years ago. And now being here for eight years, almost a decade, you know, yeah, of course. It would have been great to have invested back then in, in you know, securing your, your home yeah, but... and your, you know, having... 
But whatever plan you had coming in, is that a plan that you're working on now or that had to change? Well, the plan absolutely changed. It changes every day. I mean, okay. it, it changes okay. you and you have to go with the punches. You know, that's the reality. I mean, you cannot come and, and be, you know, uh, fixed in your position and expect things to be the way it, that you're yeah. used to. You absolutely have to be flexible. Oh. Sometimes yeah. things don't work out. Things take longer. You're, you're lucky to achieve one solid thing in a day. Um, yeah. But you have to have a plan. You know, it's a longer term. Like Olivia said, it is a marathon. What about you, Olivia? Is that your advice that you, you, have, you have to I think when you're 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 in Europe or in the US or, or outside of Africa and you have all these ideals because you're used to the, the system working, our system mm. works in a completely different way. So in essence, whatever plan I had, that was thrown into into the bin in the first week, literally. From oh, just even okay. having communication no, seriously, having conversations with the bin people, just basic stuff about when does the bin get picked up? They'll give you a day. That's okay. not the day they'll be picked up, picked up another time. So it was just little things that I started to notice that, yeah, the system runs, but it runs in a completely different kind of kind of way. So you have to be flexible and you have to be able to try and re-strategize every so often just so that you're also trying to get to where you need to get yeah. to. So literally your to-do list is always at 50 and you're only ticking off one and two because in your mind, you're like, the system should work. I should be able to get through all these things. And you have to learn. I've had to learn the hard way to not let it kind of like take over consume me because for the first few years i was very angry extremely angry that like things are not working blah, blah, blah. but you have to understand how the system works and you've got to be able to maneuver around it as much as you know i came in thinking i'm going to change africa it's gonna be amazing yeah no it doesn't work like okay that. so 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 then in business school we're taught to research your business put together a business plan and the reason why we're spending time on this is your, your business. That's what it's about. If I'm overseas and I, I'm planning to come home, you're telling me that I can do all my research, put my business plan together, put my forecast, but the moment I arrive here the first week, I take my business plan and throw it away because reality is different. Is that what you're saying? Not necessarily. You it should plan. be hard. It's bad. You have to plan. You have to plan, right? with a good deal of research time on the ground in place. You cannot sit yeah. somewhere yeah. and write a spreadsheet and a document and think that that will play out on the ground. Yeah. You really have to check okay. the marketplace here, uh, whether you're okay. in Ghana or like Nairobi or you know Lagos, Abuja, totally different. You need to really respect the marketplace that you want to play yeah. in. If you're going to write a document and a, a plan and think you went to Harvard Business School and you're going to land here and it's gonna, you're going to make it, you know, you're not going to see the growth that you want. You're probably maybe serving a market that doesn't exist, you know? So you yeah. need to respect the market. And that, 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 that okay. your market research is a fundamental part of your business planning. And that exactly. means being here on the ground and having the right partnerships and channels to make sure that you are solving the right problems with your product and service. And, you know, it takes time, you know, it does take, even for us, you know, it's taken time for us to sit back, like operate in, the, yeah. in our ecosystem, understand what the challenges are, understand yeah. where the gaps are, and then, now, you know, we've come together to form Scale Up Africa because even though we were doing different things as entrepreneurs, you know, getting to know, it's taken years for us to understand the entire ecosystem, you know, including those who are outside the, providing funding, including the government um, policy and regulations, that, you know, all of that, entrepreneurs, what they're going through on the market, on the ground. It takes a while to really understand and get it right, but you need to respect and give it that time. Would you buy anything without first knowing exactly what your product was and how it could benefit you? Definitely not. Neither should you vote for your next member of parliament without knowing who they are and how they plan to solve your problems. Watch the next MP only on Diaspora Network Television and find out the men and women who want to represent you in parliament. The next MP only on DNT. We wake up every morning to different stories from politics, business, sports, and entertainment. These stories, one way or the other, affect our lifestyle and dealings with family, friends, and business associates. Your take on Diaspora Network Television gives you an opportunity to have your take on these pertinent issues via phone in and messages to our social media platforms, DNT Ghana on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If it's an important trending story, we will definitely talk about it. Your take with me, Yao Sechi, on DNT.
Olivia, you guys have a, you have a big event coming up August 6th. Yes. Right? What is what is yes. that? Tell us about the event. So Ignite is literally, as it says, it's we're trying to ignite some fire under the bellies of foundations, big corporations, SMEs, funders, um, just diasporans, Pan-Africans who are literally wanting to see a change in the economy. So trying to kind of um, embed kind of economic empowerment. We're trying to become a conduit where we're able to plug in all the different sectors and segments and entities to be able to provide some kind of service to showcase how we're able to support these SMEs. As we said before, the reason why we we started um, Scale Up Africa was because we noticed that actually there are a number, there's a huge percentage of SMEs that once it gets to a certain stage, like in year four or five, they're no longer in business because they don't have necessarily the growth the growth mindset to be able to grow. And we started we started to notice this after you know the the startups kind of come in, they get they get their money for um, you know during their ideation and they start kind of building their business. But by year four to five, they're no longer in business anymore, and that's because there wasn't enough planning or people were not giving them you know pragmatic help or business development help to be able to scale their business. The other flip side of it as well is kind of having that mindset. So we're literally trying to be able to create a platform where we're trying to find out where are the innovations, where are the opportunities, who is doing interesting things in, in, in this market, how is policy affecting certain segments and sectors, how are we all able to come together and say, if we don't see the opportunities ourselves, Europeans, um, Americans, everybody else sees it, but we don't see it. And so let's come together. Let's form this platform where we're able to see the opportunities, the innovations, where, where are we lagging? Where do we need assistance from? Who is doing great things? How can we pull ourselves together in order to be able to make it and become more sustainable for ourselves? Because there are amazing companies and corporations and SMEs across Pan Africa that many people don't know about. So this is literally trying to do that. So it's shine a light on what people are doing across Pan Africa. And to also let the diaspora know that if you're interested in coming back home or if you're interested in doing something in Africa, let us be that conduit to be able to build that that foundation so that you know you have that due diligence. Because when you're sitting up there, you don't really know how the land lies um, in Africa. So let us be I, I that. Guess, I, I think it comes back to what we were talking about. Rather than having yeah. someone make multiple trips down to do the research of the marketplace, like you were saying, Ama, right? You, is, is your event going to help with that type of research to save that um, uh, entrepreneur uh, money from coming down so often just to do research? Is that, is that, does that address that need? It, it's part of the, the, the solution we are here to provide. I mean, we're here for entrepreneurs of African descent globally. Uh, and so, you know, mm. research and insights are a key part of that in terms of the market, like we talk about the marketplace. What kind of services can you provide, or solutions can you provide in this marketplace? Um, you know, that takes a lot of research. We have great research partners. We have great corporate partners. We have great um, ecosystem development partners, training partners. Um, we have a whole swathe of like a 360 degree support system to enable us to provide the insights, the research, the knowledge, the training. We'll be doing lots of workshops for SMEs to under understand, let's say, the digital, the new digital um, requirements now how to take it, you know, advantage of that, how to you know, approach your sales strategy, how to approach your research or your market research. We've got partners covering all of those things and some really dynamic speakers to you know, inspire, change mindsets, um, you know, just work on those soft skills and just introduce people to what we have to offer in terms of our, our team and our, our network of uh, professional service providers who, have, who are mostly uh, retaining themselves or at least you know, um, Africans that have chosen to move around the continent to do business. So we, we have a, a really eight team of speakers and partners and sponsors, and we're, we're very proud to be able to get people together all the way. I mean, we've had people come to us from Grenada, from Trinidad and Tobago, from, from New York, California, I mean, like Europe. It's been amazing just the number of people yeah. reaching out to us to say this is something that they want to talk about. They want to talk about how you know, we can better improve the rate of growth of our SMEs. Okay, so um, Olivia, has COVID made it? <clears throat> has COVID made the event the way you planned it? Has it make made it more difficult or easier? You know, I'm going to be a bit controversial. I think for us, and it's going to be controversial what I'm going to say, but I think it's actually been a blessing in disguise. Yes, I've said it. Okay. Literally, the reason behind 
um, kind of where we're at now as a business was we were trying to um, educate and inform people about how to re-strategize and pivot in in, in, in space that you're in, even before COVID came in. So the moment that COVID kind of came into play, people had to literally have to rethink about how their businesses would work, how to re-strategize for their businesses to be able to sustain and and grow and develop. And so without COVID, it, it almost forced businesses, um, as well as ours, to be able to relook at what was truly the purpose of what we're trying to achieve. And it actually added a bit, another, an extra sort of, I guess, I don't know what you would call it, but it added an extra level of um, expertise in terms of what we can bring to the table. So as much as we will keep saying to businesses, you need to you know, constantly know your purpose. You need to constantly be realizing that the strategy that you're in, is it flexible enough? Is something like this would hit? And surefire, something has happened. And we literally had to be the ones that were doing and preaching at the same time. So it's been a great learning curve, but I think we had always had okay. um, that mindset of um, apologies. My little, my little, my little, I, little okay. Okay. It's all right. If I want to play a role, Emma, how do I do so? If I want to I think participate. The first, yeah, I think the first, I mean, Olivia will probably speak to this a lot better than I can, but but I mean, um, yeah. you know, it, it's really firstly to visit our website, which is wearescaleupafrica.com. And then you can learn more about us, about what we stand for, about, you know, you can register as an attendee. Uh, we have yeah. over 70 speakers at this point, and I think we're up to... We're expecting about 3,000 um, attendees based on the registrations yeah. we have right now. So, I mean, it's going to be very dynamic. We're, we're very fortunate to have DNT on board to support us in streaming the event as well. So we're, we're very grateful for that partnership. But it's really about just plugging in to attend the event. You know, we will set the scene on the policy front with some very dynamic African speakers who are very seasoned business. We'll be having very interesting discussions with, you know, investors, with, you know, um, the funders, investor. Um, from the international community, entrepreneurs who have successfully scaled. You can hear more about their stories and we'll have workshops as well where you can get an insight as to, you know, some of the advice and services that we, we, we can offer through our, our, our network of professional service providers. So, you know, from conversations to, you know, success stories, case studies, workshops, high level panels, uh, you will learn a lot from the event to give you an idea of what is hot. And of course, we'll be looking at the marketplace as well in terms of future opportunities for you to even consider shifting your business or starting your business um, on, on the continent. So we kind of build those diaspora links, like I said, from, you know, from, you know, from the U.S. We've got so many you people. You know, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, Olivia, I, <laughs> if I come to the, if I plug into your event, right? Yeah. Chances are there is nothing that I will be told that I haven't heard before. So in the end, what I'm looking for is the jump. Is there going to be access to funding? I mean, there are, we have a platform or a number of panelists and speakers who are speaking on that specific um, okay. subject matter okay. of how you get prepared, you get ready for funding. Because I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the reasons why maybe majority of some SMEs are not able to tap into that is because they don't really have a, the proper understanding of some of the things that they need to do in order to get there, what the criteria is. And so even having some of that practical how-to would really assist them to be able to do that. There's a company, um, there's an organization that is um, plugging into it, um, they forget their names, and they basically said they only, they only fund up to a minimum of $500 million for SMEs, and they don't see that happening in Africa. And I'm like, well, there's a reason Wait, for that. Wait, hang on, hang on, time out. A minimum of $500 million? <laughs> a minimum of and $500 million. And they're talking million. about SME, that's no, but, but that's the, certain that, is, but that, that is the problem, though. That is actually yeah. the problem we're having. Uh, and the, you see, our platform is really to address some of these challenges. There are some yes. disparities in, in terms of being unrealistic about what to expect from the marketplace. So you start from the market, you understand what the needs are, you understand where the growth is going to come from, you understand where you know um, grants will come into play to maybe help yeah. a certain level of entrepreneur. You understand where, if you're talking about 500 million, we're definitely talking about a huge marketplace opportunity that is backed by data mm -hmm. research. So, so I mean, there are a lot of expectations around, you know, people come and they have a minimum. They don't want to get out of bed for, uh, you know, less than 500 million. And that's fine. Yeah. But there is a what we call the missing middle where, you know, there are people who maybe do a million or two per year and that's fine. You know, how do we help them and support them to grow their businesses consistently over time based on a market need? So, we, we you know, we have a panel as well that will actually 
features six investors on the continent who have actively invested during COVID times. There are, there, there are actually deals happening. Okay. I've been saying this so for how, now. Okay, so Olivia, take me through the mechanics of how this will play out. Because this is not a conference room where all of us sit somewhere and then we break into sessions. This is going to be on my screen. So if I turn on my screen, what should I expect to see? I think it's expect to see something that's slightly more dynamic than what you're used to. It's not. It's no difference from going to a physical conference. The only difference here is you're sat in the comfort of your own home and we're bringing you dynamism on your screens. We're using a platform called Hopin, which basically, it, it's almost like a, a normal conference conference um, room, if you like, if you like, and it has different conference rooms. So there are sort of mini breakout um, digital conference, conference rooms where you could have, you could host panelist sessions, you can host web um, um, workshops, you can host exhibitions. It's all in your screen. There'll be specific, either specific links to each of these, each of these kind of um, rooms. So you have a list of the, we'll have a program which we'll be producing um, by the end of this week. Um, and before the actual day, we'll be communicating the different links. So if you're interested in maybe being a part of a workshop specifically on for example, how to return home, what to look out for, et cetera, et cetera. There'll be a timing allo allocated to that, and there'll be a specific link to a specific room where you can come and get involved and, and kind of participate in that. So it's really quite straightforward. And I think a lot of people are still hung up on the fact that it's going to be digital. It's a huge conference. How is it all going to roll off? It's probably a lot, a lot easier to do it online and digitally than within kind of going, everyone driving to, um, you know, Kempinski and having a few drinks. We won't be having drinks, of course, but having a few drinks and actually having a conference Why in a physical form. Why can't I have form. drinks? Oh, I can have you drinks can have in my own house. You're in home. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. So, so what are your success metrics? How do you know whether you succeeded or you didn't quite get to your mark? Well, I want you to say this one. <laughs> yeah, I know. I knew you could look at me for this one. Uh, we're definitely looking at hitting specific numbers. Um, like yeah. I said, 3,000 is our magic number, and I think we're well ahead of target on that one. We're definitely looking at a, a global reach. So we're definitely looking at, like I say, people tuning in from you know, from the US, the Caribbean, and Europe in particular, and of, of course, across Africa. And again, we're, we're pretty much on target to achieve that. We're definitely looking at more diasporans tuning into our services in terms of you know business support and all the you know the 360 degree support that we give to businesses that are are looking to grow and get insights as to which you know sectors or, or areas to get into to tap into real growth of uh, our assets and you know profitability statistics for our SMEs and al also to engage more with the international community where it comes to donor funding uh, you know development finance institutions investors who are interested in really having a serious conversation about how we support. Uh, SMEs and, and improve the quality and growth prospects of our SMEs in Africa and the diaspora. Okay, how long is the event? Go ahead, go ahead, Sorry. please. No, I was going to say go just ahead, to add on, an, an area would be to, to just showcase to everybody outside of Africa that there are amazing things happening here. I mean, that if one person can come away and just go, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that Africa had this organization that did this or is connected to, that's, that's a win. That's an absolute win because we're also trying to change the narrative. We're also trying to let big media people know that there are amazing things happening in Africa. Yes, we have an issue, so does every single country, but there are amazing things happening in on the continent. And so watch out. Uh, I wanna I wanna piggyback on that. When you arrive on an airplane, right? You find yes. that the, the the immigration queue, the Ghanaian line, the Ghanaian queue is shorter, the foreign line is very long. What do yeah. what opportunities do foreigners see in Ghana that Ghanaians who left Ghanaians in the diaspora don't see? I can only speak from my own experience from living abroad and then coming here, and also having mm -hmm. um, I guess friends who've come from from either end and seeing how our mindset is like, and it it, it dates back to education, and I think a lot of it is mm -hmm. the way in which we're educated here, which is that whole chew and pour mentality of 
you have to take on board whatever your teacher says to you. You can't, you can't retort. You can't have your own mindset. So I think we're kind of brought up in a very kind of, I feel like we're brought up back in my day when I was in school, we're very brought up in very kind of like narrow mindset. So you didn't really think outside the box. You couldn't really see opportunities, even at a young age. And you carry that through all the way until you get into um, your working life and it carries on. So I think there's, a, there's an element of that and there's an element of actually seeing how Europeans and Americans, so people abroad, are brought up, like being in class four many, many, many moons ago, and a teacher kind of asking a question to a student, a European student, and him retorting. And I thought, that kid is going to get whooped. He's going to get beaten up. And no, the teacher actually welcomed that. We don't do that. So I think that has carried through to our working lives. And that's probably why a lot of our diaspora or, or European or American counterparts see opportunities way before we do. And that's my personal opinion from what I've seen from ed being educated a little bit here and being educated in, in Europe. Okay. Well, so your event, how long is it? What's the duration? It, it's probably going to be about eight hours, only because we're trying to get, eight, if you're okay. tapping from anywhere around the world, we want to be able to start at a time where you're not having to get up at midnight or 2 a.m. To, to tap into it. So probably start from about noon, moving on to, towards about maybe 8 p.m. Yeah. So everybody has GMT. an opportunity to actually get it. Okay. Yeah, GMT, GMT. sorry. Yeah. Would there be uniformed allocated breaks or people can just break off to go eat something and rejoin? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have interview intervals and, you know, segments where, you know, we have performers from the creative industry to showcase what they're doing as well. We're really trying to blend it really is a business, small business festival. Uh, so you will have some yeah. entertainment in the intervals like that and in between the panels, the conversations and um, you know, the, the hardcore work workshops. So there'll be a blend and there'll be, there'll be some pretty light uh, intervals as well to enable people to kind of dip in and out. And like Olivia said, you know, we have the main stage and then we'll have breakout sessions. And so, you know, you, you can pick and mix and choose as you wish based on your segment or area of interest. And then, you know, it, it should be quite a, a fluid day for you to, to uh, tap yeah. into. As the national regulator of the communications industry in Ghana, the National Communications Authority seeks to ensure an environment that is safe and fair for consumers and service providers. NCA grants licenses and authorizations for operation of communication systems and services, develops guidelines to streamline communication activities, establish and monitor quality of service indicators for operators and service providers. NCA is in eight regions, Nakra, Tamale, Takradi, Kumar, Masi, Ho, Kofaridua, Sunyani, and Bolgatanga. Do you have unresolved complaints with the service providers? Contact us on 0800 Between the hours of 8 o'clock a.m. and 5 o'clock p.m. from Monday to Friday or visit our website at www.nca.org.gh and follow the procedure for filing a complaint or submitting inquiry. National Communications Authority communications for development we wake up every morning to different stories from politics business sports and entertainment these stories one way or the other affect our lifestyle and dealings with family friends and business associates your take on diaspora network television gives you an opportunity to have your take on these pertinent issues via phone in and messages to our social media platforms dnt ghana on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If it's an important trend and story, we will definitely talk about it. Your take with me, Yalsechi, on DNT. Would you buy anything without first knowing exactly what the product was and how it could benefit you? Definitely not. Neither should you vote for your next member of parliament without knowing who they are and how they plan to solve your problems. Watch the next MP only on Diaspora Network Television and find out the men and women who want to represent you in Parliament. The next MP only on DNT. Is there a sustain or this is a one-off thing? No, I think it's, it's going to hopefully be a yearly thing because it would be... I mean, depending on, not even depending on, after the end of this very first one where we're, you know, at the end of the way, we're curating all of the information and figuring out what the next steps are. We want it to be a solution-based conference. 
So it was not just a case of having okay. a conversation about our problems and innovations, but at the end of it, just saying, how are we able to fix one or two problems within within various segments? So maybe, you know, we look, we look at that and when um, Scale Up Africa could be that conduit that, that looks at what the key performance indicators are in order to come back next year and, and kind of say, this is the case study, this is the impact of how last year's what we said we would do has gone has gone right in in agriculture or in in manufacturing or whatever it is. So I think as time goes on, it will end up being this is our maiden event, but it will end up being a yearly thing that we will do in order to showcase the impact of some of the areas that we've all agreed to to fix or some of the solutions that we notice and we need to maybe plug in different partners to be able to help us solve it. Well, this the, to me, I, I think uh, the more I listen to you guys the more interested I get because, uh, you know, in doing, doing business in Africa, uh, capital is always a, a challenge. And yeah. uh, also the dynamics, yeah. you know, people, we come here with all kinds of tendencies and stuff. And so I, I've been here since 2012 and I'm still getting used to the system. And so uh, this is very important, but I'm wondering if you're collaborating with any other organization or any government agency, or this is just strictly private sector. Oh, it's private sector and, and private sector led, but we're certainly uh, very much in 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 line with uh, you know the Ministry of Business Development, the Diaspora Office uh, here at the Office of the President. We're we're very much aligned with what they are doing because they are very much looking at. Um, you know, connecting with other ministries to, to have a more unified uh, approach to supporting the diaspora to do business. And don't forget, you know, not everyone's going to come back home and move to Africa. I mean, it's a great, it's a great concept, but it's not for everyone. <laughs> we should definitely look at, you know, uh, deepening our business links in terms of exports and, you know, trade and partnerships, you know, using our yeah. technology, our talent, our products, our resources in between, um, you know, the Africa as a, as a mainland and of course export markets as well. So if you're in California or the UK or wherever you are in the world, you know, you can still learn about, let's say, agribusiness and how can you, how can you be um, a crowd investor or how can you be, how can you tap in as, you know, someone who can take care of marketing and logistics for an export business. These are all opportunities that people can still tap into without having necessarily to move um, back to the continent because that's not everybody and you know we, we need people out there to also you know provide uh, market opportunities for, for export and to get foreign exchange in to the continent as well so it's, it's very much global um, stage we're gonna have some difficult conversations about where we are what needs to improve but I, I feel that this is very much like as you know the, the theme is ignite to ignite a global movement of, of um, entrepreneurship growth because it's not just about survival now we need to create jobs and economic wealth and justice for, you know, people of African descent globally. And that's a reality. We know why. We know about the colonialism and we know about the fact that we don't always see the opportunities right in front of us. But a lot of people do. There's a, there is a scramble for Africa. So we, we, we are here to really set the stage to, to, to figure out how we can do better in, in our mission. Olivia, I want you to take me to the minds of the Ghanaian diaspora or the African diaspora, okay? <laughs> Look, okay. I live in California. I've made me okay. some money. I'm invested in real estate. I get a moderate return. But you know what? When I flip on the light, it flips. When I turn on the water, it, 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 it flows. When I drive on the street, I don't have to dodge potholes. And over here, I don't see my nephews trying to pull me down. Why should I yeah. give all that up? come to a place where the moment you start making it, you got all kinds of people pulling. you. Why is that even worth my time? But I mean, as Emma said, it's not, it's, Ghana's not for everybody. Africa's not for everybody. It's come, you know, move back home. It's not for everybody. And also, if you look at how, what COVID has kind of, since COVID happened, the new future looks completely different from how we all imagined future would look like. So say, for example, if COVID hadn't hit, we would not all be comfortable working from home, like virtual working. What does that mean? Whereas in Europe, they've been doing that since the beginning of time. Whereas in, in Africa now, we're getting comfortable with it only because we've been forced to be in that situation. So in the same breath as saying 
you know, if somebody wants to move back or maybe they're not quite right, they're not quite ready to move back because of all the issues that you've mentioned, they don't necessarily need to. Because right now we're moving towards a new future, which means you can be anywhere in the world, work from anywhere in the world and be sitting on the beach or whatever you want and be able to start to do business. So technology being as it is and it moving leaps, leaps, um, um, leaps and bounds forward, I don't think if you're not ready to move back home, I would literally say don't because it's not for the faint hearted. Ghana is definitely not for the faint hearted. It's 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 hard work, it's hardcore, but the, the results and, and the and the opportunities are bountiful. But you have to literally have a thick skin to be able to manage every single day all the issues that we all face. But as I said, that builds character because I think if you flipped it the other way, and I'm sorry to say if we were in Europe and all these issues were happening, I don't think the economy would flourish. I mean our economy is still tough, but I think we make it work for us because you know we, we're made of stronger stuff, we've got the grit. So if you're not ready to move back home, I say don't. If you see that there are opportunities here and there are, and there are people that you can align with or parties you can align with for them, for you to be able to do business, do that. Don't kind of move to a country where you know that there are issues with when you flick on the light, you're going to have an issue. And if that's going to give you a heart attack, stay in LA. It's all good. Stay in LA, hang out with Jay-Z and his people yeah, but- and we will do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> but if I stay there, is the ground conducive enough for virtual business? What do you mean in Africa? Is the Absolutely. We're, yeah. we're definitely moving towards that. It's not perfect. It's definitely not perfect, but we're definitely okay. moving towards that. We're seeing the opportunities with, if you look at a company like MTN or Vodafone or of these worlds, the big, the big kind of um, telcos, uh, kind of putting together deals in terms of how they can make their services a lot more streamlined or a lot more flexible, but also to the fact that they know that because of COVID, like their internet needs to be on point. And it has been over the last month or so, I must admit, whilst I've been using the internet on a regular basis, you're starting to see that there's a slight shift in better service, better, you know, they're looking at the, the quality control of their internet. They're looking at how they can drill further in, 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 in big rivers or water, whatever it is, so that their connectivity is better. It's not going to happen overnight, but we're definitely getting there. It's going to take time. We just all have to be patient. We're going to get there. It's just going to take time. All right. And like, uh, so and like you said about the business model, question. the business planning is very mm-hmm. important uh, as well. The business model that you want to deploy is actually really key. You okay. you really have to think about that. But you, yeah, it not be it might not be high tech. Maybe low tech. It's all going to change. Sorry. But it's all going to change when I get on the ground. You say you it's all going to change when I get on the ground. The implementation of it was, might you have change. To know what to expect. Yeah, you need to understand that, you know, you need to really spend time to understand the marketplace, you know, and so, and that okay. means being okay. fluid. Yeah, that means being fluid and taking time. Okay, this this question, um, when we all left, I don't know how you guys left. I mean, in, in your case, Olivia, I'm sure your, your dad was a diplomat, so it was easy. I'm a, I don't know how you ended up in UK, but for most of us, we just got on the plane to a place that we didn't know. We had no clue how the place worked. Um, we had no money, but we took that chance. We took that chance. But now that we're older and more experienced, more money, we don't want to take a chance on a place where we're more familiar than the place we left to go live there. Why is it that we're so caught when it comes down to coming back. But when it, it was time for us to go, we just threw caution in the wind. Educate me on that. Old What's the what? mindset? Yeah, it's good old fashioned mindset and colonialism. And, you know, that is unfortunately a huge part of the equation because who's going to build our home for us? You know? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, this goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's a mindset issue. And, you know, you can't mm. change people's mindset overnight. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, we, we have. You know, everyone's talking about neocolonialism and people are coming here, the Chinese, they're lending us money, we're taking loans, they're investing. It's absolutely true. Um, and so, you know, it's a mindset issue and that, that's really the uh, And so it's it's not for everyone, it's, it is tough, but you know, if you're gonna go abroad and some people go sleep in cars and, you know, hustle for years and, you know, um, yeah. people are, you know, dying across the Mediterranean and the Sahara, Libya, you know, all this stuff is happening. So, I mean, it, but it's it's really up to you and your mindset of what you see as opportunity, because opportunity really is for those who open their eyes to to see it and to do something to capture that opportunity. So 
mindset is everything, I think. All right. I feel like the fundamental thing. So in end then what's uh, what are you looking to what what does it what where do you see the business community, let's say five years from now, with what you're doing? How what are you looking to achieve five years from now? Build the business yeah, I mean, we're the, definitely the looking to have Yeah, we're definitely looking to have with more uh, linkages between big business and small business. I think that's very important, you know, like you know, the, the telephonicas of this world, the cosmos energies of this world. They are the ones who we need to work with and to support people like us who are in the enterprise development space to grow more successful uh, SMEs. You know, the government has a part to play in terms of linking up with better quality service provision for entrepreneurship growth. And so we are looking to really tap into those relationships to improve the mm -hmm. and access to resources, growth support and funding for SMEs uh, that are Africa centric. So that, that, that's for us what we, we want to achieve. Have a, a very close um, knit community of SMEs, corporations, uh, development finance institutions, and you know, forward looking uh, growth um, led entrepreneurs to, to really grow and, and create the jobs we need, we need to see. Definitely, definitely. Brian, and just Olivia. looking at the impact, impact from that, absolutely. Yes. Okay, after listening to you ladies for about 45, 50 minutes. I'm a businessman. I'm still sitting on a yeah. fence in terms of deciding whether to come or not. Olivia, why don't you use the last two minutes to convince me? Convince to, you to, to come to attend the event. To attend your event, yes. I mean, the one thing that I will say, and I, and I come at it from a very patriotic standpoint, not even from a business mm -hmm. standpoint, but our time is now, Africa's time is now. Many, many years ago where they did, the Mackenzie's of these world would do research and just say the next top 10 nations are the BRIC nations or the D11s. Africa's always been the continent to invest in because the opportunities here are bountiful. We're now seeing it. We're now, the narrative around it is around kind of the whole Black Lives Matter. We're trying to take that to the next level to just say, if Black Lives Matter, let's support each other because we don't. But the time is now where you're seeing that there are, there is innovation, there is excitement, there are, there's movement in terms of people wanting to see Africa prosper and do well and, and be sustainable. So that needs to look, we need to look back in terms of how are we supporting each other in business? How are we supporting each other in opportunities within Africa? So if you're still on the fence, I think, well, if you want to see the continent thrive within the next five to 10 years, this is the time now to be involved in that conversation. There's a time now to actually be pragmatic to just say, I'm going to do something um, solution-based to actually help the continent grow. Whatever, however small, however big or medium it is, this is the time now for us all to collaborate, come together and just and work together to be as solid as how you see the Chinese are, as how you see the Lebanese are, because they're very well connected. They believe in the power of collaboration. Now's the time for Af Africa to literally rise because we've been saying it for many years, but now is the time because there's a new generation who are literally excited and empowered by where we're moving to and they see the innovations in Africa and on the continent. So now is the time. So don't sit on the fence. Go on to wearescaleupafrica.com okay. and hit a and come now. <laughs> okay. I'll give you the final word, Amma. I think I'm convinced. I'm coming. Final word, Amma. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, you know, just to echo what Olivia said, you know, this is our time. It's the only continent and home we have. Um, there, there are a lot of people in distress all over the world, you know, in different situations. Yeah. We need to understand our history and understand that we have a unique moment in time to make a difference. So Scale Up Africa's Ignite Festival will give you insights and you know, you'll hear from real leaders across the diaspora and African business landscape to better understand what the opportunities are. I'll leave you with one statistic from the one of the segments that we're going to be running is on agriculture. So that's food, that's natural products, that's cosmetics. It, agriculture in just 10 years, African agriculture in just 10 years will be worth over $1 trillion in just 10 years time. That, that will be the size of the African agriculture uh, business opportunity. So, I mean, you know, you can do your nine to five and that's fine. Not everyone's meant to be an entrepreneur or, or business people, but I know people do want to get together. They do want to partner, they do want to collaborate, but we need to set the stage now to have a stronger foundation as a diaspora, you know, African diaspora uh, with, with a, you know, very solid um, foundation and a collaborative um, approach to building and creating better SMEs for, for economic growth. 
sleeping. All right. So and how do I participate again, Olivia? You are giving me an address to go. I'm mm -hmm. logging on right now. <laughs> go What's to www.scaleupafrica.com. You can't miss it. You can Scale click attend. Yes. Okay. As well as also help with our funding. We're trying to raise as much funding post COVID 19 SMEs and by, by helping to raise money to help those affected, the SMEs affected by um, COVID 19. So there's also a button on the feed to click to, in order to help sponsor um, as much as you can to be able to afford us to help SMEs across Pan Africa. Thank you so much, ladies. I, I have to be honest. I Before I started speaking with you, I had a different, I guess, attitude about your event, but you guys have educated me. I will be the first uh, to sign on come August 6th. And you know, I want to also really thank you for someone who believe in the diaspora as much as I do. It is just amazing to see two very enterprising ladies leading this um, charge to get to galvanize uh, the business of SME. So I really thank you for appearing on Diaspora Network Television. This has so, been Diaspora Weekly, and I was joined by Ama Jampo and Olivia Sirinto, two brilliant ladies. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Speak to you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.